and, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Roll call. Please. <laughs> Looks like Commissioner Bergman is absent. Uh, Commissioner Marsters. Present. Commissioner Gutierrez. Present. Vice Chair Silverman. Present. Chair Harper Pedersen. Present. Thank you. Is anybody here for a public comment? Public comment is actually for items not on the listed agenda. Is anybody here to speak on an item that is not on the listed agenda? Okay. Seeing nobody and having no speaker cards, we'll move on to the approval of the minutes. Um, did everybody have a chance to look at the May, excuse me, April 7th minutes? Does anybody have any changes or addition to those minutes? I think, he was, I think he was talking about uh, under public comments, Andre, I think it was stolen car, not solar car issue. Uh, what was this? Well, it is the stolen car. It was a stolen car. solar car. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, move approval. Great. Uh, can I go ahead and get a second for that? Second. second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Thank you, everybody. Okay, and next we are moving on to the consent item. The consent item is the uh, general plan conformity determination for the County of San Mateo's uh, disposition of real property at one and two Circle Star Way. Um, and I'm going to be recusing myself from this matter. Oh, and not participating in any way. Great. Thank you for letting us know that. Um, Unless anybody would like to pull the item from consent, uh, I'd love to entertain a motion. So moved. I just wanted to ask one quick question. Sure. And, and that's of staff. So when this, or if this passes, the um, property goes back on the tax rolls for the city of San Carlos? Correct. Okay, thank you. That's all I wanted to know. Okay. Um, Great, and I'm sorry, we had a... Uh, is there an actual motion? Yeah. yeah, there is a motion. You want to do it or you want me to? Okay. I move that the Planning Commission adopt the attached resolution and determine that the disposition of real property at 1 and 2 Circle Star Way and 117 Industrial Way APN 04624180 is in conformity with the general plan based on the findings and for the reasons incorporated in the staff report. Second. Um, do we need to read the findings or, no, or are we fine? Great. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Now we're going to move on to our public hearing items. Uh, since I see some new faces in the crowd, I will go over the public hearing procedure. Uh, the staff is going to present a report on the history, physical features, et cetera, of the application followed by the staff's recommendation. Then the applicant will make a presentation. Thereafter, any interested parties may get up and speak on the matter. Um, Please do so by filling out a speaker's card, which, can, which is located at the front desk over there by the doors. Hand it to staff, and they will hand it to me. Um, I will call people interested in speaking in the order in which I receive these cards, at which point you can come up, speak into the microphone, and uh, that will be noted for the minutes. Um, after everybody has had the chance to be heard, the hearing will be closed and no, there, no further discussion from the floor can be held. The Commission will consider the evidence and make its recommendation. If you or somebody, ex excuse me, if you challenge a public hearing item in court, you may be limited to items raised only by you or somebody else during public hearing. As described in this notice, public notice or written correspondence to the city prior to this hearing. Um, Again, please say your name clearly at the microphone. That will help with the minutes. And we will move on to item A, which is 501 Walnut Street. Request for a conditional use permit, approval for parking reduction, and design review approval for an additional, uh, an addition to a historic structure. What's wrong with me? And is that Gavin? Great. Hi. Good evening, Chair Harper Pedersen and the members of the Planning Commission. My name is Gavin Monahan. I'm assistant planner here in the city of San Carlos, and I will be taking you through the application for a proposed new dental office at 501 Walnut Street. 
Specifically, the applicants are asking for uh, a conditional use permit to allow for an alternate parking design, which would allow for two less spaces, and design, re design review approval for an addition to a historic structure. So absent the conditional use permit, the design review approval would be a staff level item, but because we have the conditional use permit as, as an entitlement, as part of this application, we're taking the full request for entitlements to the Planning Commission tonight. 501 Walnut is a historic structure, it's a historic property. It was determined um, through a survey in 2004 that the building was eligible to be listed on the state of California's um, inventory of historic resources. If you've taken a chance to go by, you'll see that it's located on a corner site. It has two prominent elevations, the one that's on Holly Street and then also the one that's on Walnut Street. Um, and both of those face the street and have quite a bit of public uh, access and view, which is something that's nice for our historic structures. The lot, underlying lot is approximately 10,500 square feet. It's basically a square. The zoning is mixed use and the general plan is mixed use. The zoning for this site allows for the MUD is one of the most flexible zoning districts in the mixed use, uh, in our collection of mixed use districts. It allows for uh, office, retail, housing, um, restaurant. There's a whole, quite a wide list of uses that are permitted use. And in this case, the dental business is a permitted use. It's a permitted outright use. So the request for entitlements tonight are for uh, changes in the parking structure that they've proposed, which would allow uh, the historic building to be um, less modified and more visible without having the parking intrude upon the two public facades. That's really the, the impetus of requesting the parking, the CUP for a parking reduction. You could place all, there's nine required uh, spaces. I want to just kind of get, get through the basics here. Nine required parking spaces for this particular use. They could be placed on the site, but it, it goes with, uh, it comes at a cost of jeopardizing either the proposed um, best uh, proposal for an addition, which puts the addition on the back of the residence, causing less change in modifications to the front. And it also, putting additional parking on site or, or a different parking design would likely require parking on um, additional front elevations, so you'd see the parking in front of the structure. Um, those are things that I will go in a little bit more detail later on in the, in the presentation. Those are things that we uh, don't advocate for with historic properties. So the project, the physical request, um, along with the parking reduction of two spaces, is for this addition. The addition would allow for a modern dental practice to be added to a historic structure. We typically call this adaptive reuse. Sometimes a historic structure like a bank or a restaurant can be adaptively reused with no changes to the exterior walls whatsoever, no addition. Um, that's possible. But when there's a change of use from something that um, was not, the building was not normally constructed for, it oftentimes an addition is done. This is pretty common uh, through the rehabilitation um, allowances of the Secretary of Interior standards for the treatment of historic properties. So in this case, they're going that route. They're doing a rehabilitation. They're adding 1,556 square feet to the rear of the structure. You'll see in the staff report, it says 1,509. The previous set of plans were at 1,509 and the set I was working from while drafting the staff report. Um, and then this, the set that we distributed to you is an updated set, which is 1,556. Just as a point of note, it, it changes 47 square feet, but it doesn't change the parking requirement. It's, it's, it's incremental. Uh, but I want to point that out. The uh, addition is approximately 30 by 50. It's in the rear of the building. It'll be finished in different materials, and I'll go into this a little bit later. There are, uh, the Secretary of Interior has standards for the treatment of historic properties, uh, and they basically provide um, guidelines and they provide standards that we follow as a city um, when reviewing historic buildings. Uh, reviewing the standards, uh, one of the things that's important is being able to distinctively identify what's old from new, so you don't mimic an old structure by adding on the same exact type of windows, siding, trim, uh, and all of the details. You don't want the layperson to look at a building and not know what's new and what's old. But at the same time, you don't want the addition to be so different from the building that it, it isn't compatible with it. So it's a dance to do an addition to a historic structure, not copy it, which is actually quite easy to do. It's easy to mill materials and find the same uh, types of paints and windows and stuff and just replicate it. But in this case, we don't want to do that. We want to have a, a design that's somewhat different but is compatible with the existing. So that, is the, that was the, the marching orders that the applicants had to work with. So in this case, it'll be finished in a smooth plaster which is distinct from the, from the historic uh, structure's shingle siding. It'll have a water table that's applied to it in a similar fashion that the existing red brick is. If you saw it now, it has that red brick course around it that's um, at, at the porch level. The water table of the supplied stone will have a similar texture and relief and pattern, but it won't be the same color or material, so it'll be distinct from it. 
Um, and then again, the scale of the addition will not overwhelm the historic structure, so I'm looking at it from the Holly Street facade specifically. That's really the facade where you'll see this addition is on the Holly Street side. The Walnut Street side, you'll see it in plan view in your drawings, but standing on Holly Street from across the street looking at the building, you actually won't see the addition because it, it only bumps out a few feet. Um, so the addition's in a scale that doesn't overwhelm the historic structure, and in this case, it's one story, the historic structure is two story. They both have relatively low roof lines, which is uh, a nice design of the original home. The current addition or the proposed addition also has a low roof line. In this case, it's a hip roof, so it comes into the historic building without having to um, um, obscure any of the second story uh, elements. You'll see the full second story in its entirety after this addition is put on with only the, um, the El Camino facing facade, that northeastern facade will be the only facade that really has some um, addition that's blocking it. That's the main section where the addition will block it. And then the, re the request is to remove four ordinance sized trees. The staff report refers to two of the trees as redwoods. They actually aren't. They're, they're an ornamental um, variety of tree that looks like a redwood, but they have prickly branches, and they were popular in the 1950s. So, but um, they're still, it doesn't matter in San Carlos, it's really just based on the circumference size. If a tree is greater than 36 inches in circumference, measured four feet up, then we require a tree removal permit. So those are also in the, in the packet for you to look at tonight for approvals. One of the trees is actually in the footprint of the addition, and one of the findings is, uh, is to use a property um, to a higher level uh, for better economic enjoyment, which is a finding for removing that tree. And the other three trees, you'll see some, some of the photos have grown where they're obscuring the second floor of the building. One of the trees has significant branches um, on the building, which cause a lot of detritus and build, build up and back up on the roof. So the applicants would like to remove those and install new landscaping um, compliant with our requirements for replacement trees. It's more in scale with the building, so when the project's done, you'll actually get to see the historic resource instead of having it obscured by the, the two magnolias and the two um, evergreen trees that are there now on the holly uh, side elevation. So one of the things we were asking for is that the project be compatible with the Secretary of Interior standards for the treatment of historic properties. For this particular request, the addition's in a scale that doesn't overwhelm, as we discussed. The proposed window pattern for the addition, it complements the historic fenestration of the existing house, but it doesn't replicate it. It's not the same windows, they're not the same size, but they're in sort of the same cadence that you find on the house, so when you're walking by, it'll be harmonious, but it'll be distinctively new. The low hip roof, as I discussed, also does not intercept the second floor um, very little so that it preserves the second floor elevation and details. And then the parking and landscape plan complements the structure without obscuring it. And I'll go a little bit more into parking under the conditional use permit section. I wanted to really talk about the proposal um, in its physical form, the addition. So I'm going to start with those images and go through those, and then we'll go into the conditional use permit request. So this is the Holly Street elevation. These are these ornamental evergreen trees that we discussed. This is a magnolia tree that's out here, and I have some pictures I can show at the end of the presentation of the damage it's causing to walks in hardscape. And there's another magnolia tree back here that's actually in the footprint of the addition. So the addition would go back in this section here, and I'll show you some pictures of that. There was a nice, uh, the, the um, designer of the project did a great photo sim with dotted lines right. on the existing house with the great um, perspective drawing to show exactly where it fits. So it's, it was a really neat way of seeing where the addition's gonna go, and those are included in your packet. This is the Walnut Street elevation. This is the prime elevation, which has the porch and the details here, if I get the cursor up here. So this home has some interesting history. I'm gonna leave this elevation up and just go over it. The home was originally uh, constructed as a single family residence in 1914. It was moved one block over from the corner that had different street names, which I think is San Carlos Avenue now, to this corner lot, basically within the same block and oriented it was kind of neat because it was a corner house at the time and it was reoriented on a corner. So the, you see the elevations and the design of the building work be on a corner and they worked at the previous location and they work here. So it was moved, I think, sometime in the 20s or 30s. It's in the staff report uh, of the attachment that's from the original historic evaluation in 2004. The home is constructed in the arts and crafts style. This is specifically called a craftsman style house. Um, there was a whole variety of architecture that fit under the arts and crafts um, designation. In California, we have a lot of these craftsmen design. You'll see a lot in Pasadena, Berkeley, uh, along the peninsula of Palo Alto and in the South Bay. Um, and they're known for their, they can be known for their low roof lines like this particular one with their large overhanging eaves. And they always had these prominent barge boards. The barge board is the last of the rafters on the house. It's, a, it's the rafter that's not a, covered by roofing and it's exposed. And they typically had, most of the arts and crafts homes had knee brackets. So they were like a, 
a triangle-shaped bracket that held up the overhanging eaves. This house instead has these staggered outriggers. They're, they're um, made up beams, constructed beams, most likely out of redwood that stagger out and then each one of them um, changes in size. And I have a detailed picture which I'll show you. It's quite impressive. Uh, here we go. So that's a better up close picture. So it was, it's the city's desire to maintain these historic structures. They're important to the history of San Carlos. They add a lot of character and interest to the, to the town, uh, to the city. Um, and it's in the city's interest in, to preserve them for a variety of reasons. So as you can imagine, and you probably know, this house was, this is, I refer to it as a house because it was constructed as a single family house. The structure was for sale for about a year. And staff went through um, dozens, if not nearly 100 inquiries of different particular uses for it. Um, and many of the uses were proposal, the, a proposal to demolish the structure and put in some other new use, so condos, apartments, um, a restaurant, mixed use. It runs the gamut for things that are allowed in the mixed use downtown zoning district. So the um, desire for the, this particular group of applicants to, bring, to, to use the structure as an adaptive reuse for a dental office was really quite attractive. It preserves the existing historic structure. It allows the modern dental practice to go into a new building, and I'll talk a little bit about that. The dental practice, as you can imagine, has quite a bit of infrastructure in, in the walls, in the floor, um, even in the chair you sit in, it has quite a bit of, of, of you know, lines for oxygen and water and suction. Um, and those things would be difficult to put in a uh, historic structure without causing a bunch of damage to it, without basically gutting it. So in this case, it's a, it was a perfect scenario for the applicants. They could purchase it. They could put reception, admin, files, um, lobby, all of those types of things in the existing structure, and then build a new wing that housed the modern dental practice with the treatment and exam rooms. So that is what the proposal is, is to put the modern um, uh, dental practice actually in the addition. So that would um, allow um, much of the existing structure to be uh, maintained and preserved without disrupting it with the new construction. So some other things that were notable for the arts and crafts period were these large porches, um, quite a bit of, of windows and fenestration, the divided light windows. This house has um, quite a lot of, uh, of glass in it, and they're all divided light casement windows, and they're really in a neat scale and proportion and symmetry throughout all four elevations of the house. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a challenge to have a structure like this that you want to add on to or you want to do something different with and be able to pull that off, do that addition without really causing a lot of damage to the existing structure. So we worked with the applicants and they had um, hired a designer who was quite competent in getting all of their requests and demands uh, in an addition on a historic structure and still meeting the Secretary of Interior standards. So this is the existing elevation on the top and you'll see the proposed elevation with the addition to the left-hand side of this image on the bottom image. These are the two images here. One of the changes to the site would be removal of a two detached two-car garage that's in the rear of the property. That was, um, there seemed to be some suspect about the actual age of the garage. And if you look at it up close, it has siding that matches the house on the front, but the sides, the rear and sides, of the one side has no siding because there was an addition that was torn off. The right-hand side, as you face, it has a shiplap siding, which was a, from a different period of time than the construction of this house. So it's likely a structure that's either from somewhere else or was heavily modified. When you look at this, the two-car garage, you can see where it looks like at one point it was a one-car garage and it was added onto. So staff sent the application out with the proposal, um, the images, the materials, the colors, the proposal for the dentist practice, and all of the um, this background and application materials to a historic consultant that we use for evaluation, Dr. Laura Jones. Um, and she evaluated it for um, its conformance with the Secretary of Interior Standards. And her report is in the packet as an attachment as well. So this is some of the, some of the finished deals, it's finished deals, finished details, excuse me, for the addition. So again, on this side is the existing home, and on the other side is the new addition here. This again is existing up here, so the second story remains um, unmolested on all four elevations. And this is up close, the window detail with the siding, and then this cultured stone that's applied on the water table, the lower part of it, to be similar in, in uh, texture and relief of the existing structure. So one of the requirements we have is a proposal for landscaping. Um, in this case, the zoning district requires 15% landscaping. And the application um, that's in front of you is over 30% landscaping. 
think it's about 32% landscaping, but it's twice the required amount of landscaping. Um, so the landscaping serves several purposes. One is uh, these new trees would be recommendations for replacement of the uh, mature trees if they're approved for removal. Uh, the landscaping that's on this side here is a buffer for the parking areas and also to provide, to provide visual interest. The current site it's parking on the right-hand side, as you look at it from Walnut Street, has no little or no landscaping. There is one very large jacaranda tree that's in the basically in the middle of the property, and the applicants at this point have pr proposed to retain that tree. It's in this section here. So the landscaping out here would be low. There would be a, a gravel path that walks out to either a bird bath or an urn or some type of small water feature. Um, that would not, you know, it would be a small thing that wouldn't dwarf the house, obviously, or call too much attention to it. But it would allow um, people that are waiting to either be seen or waiting for a family member to walk out and enjoy the yard. And the rest of it would be lower plants, with the exception of the trees here, that would help buffer and screen the addition on this side and add visual interest on the other elevations of the, of the existing historic structure. So this is the proposed parking. I'm going to go a little bit into the conditional use permit request. So again, they're asking for a conditional use permit for an alternate parking, that's what our code calls it, for the reduction of two spaces. They're required nine if you do the math for the overall square footage. Um, and staff actually recommended this to the applicants that they could ask for a parking reduction. Um, there were other plans that showed this building truncated here with more addition out here. The first plan brought the addition way out here onto, Walnut, onto Holly Street um, with an additional parking on this side. So there was literally parking on this side this side and over here. Um, future iterations came up with this plan showing seven regulation size on-site parking with a hammerhead. Um, other plans showed the max, the um, minimum amount of parking achieved but with less, um, maybe a less uh, efficient access. This allows people to drive in and then they can back out from this spot or they can pull to the end here, pull in, do the hammerhead and pull back out onto Walnut Street facing out. This is the accessible spot and there's one standard spot next to it. This is a picture from a few years ago. It was previously, the building was previously occupied by a local architectural firm. And uh, you'll see that this is, so this is the front elevation here. This is the, the accessible spot and the extra spot. And this is how it was previously used. You'll see the cars parked here. One of them is in the accessible spot. There's a spot here. And even prior to this request for the, this new use as the dental office, that the users of this, previous users of the site were utilizing the site in a similar fashion with this diagonal kind of nose in at, a, at an angle to the property line parking. The difference is here they had, still have the existing garage back here which takes up the space, the parking area for the hammerhead and at least one of the parking spaces. So if we were to park this in this photo simulation, you'd probably get about the two cars that are here and approximately three cars or four cars here maximum. And this photo is from several years ago. But there's really not much of a change here except for that we're going to now have a specified delineated parking area um, and there will be some changes here to the access for ADA. Instead of going up this sort of clunky ramp that's not in great shape, they can go up a lift here um, and access the front of the building so it's actually less of a travel distance so it's better for people with accessibility issues um, and with less of an impact by removing some of this additional material here that's not historic or, or not particularly aesthetic. So the conditional use permit request is for the removal of uh, two parking spaces. This is a picture of the street. So we were looking at kind of looking at some of the findings for conditional use permits. Um, in this case, I don't have a date for this photo. There's nobody parked out front here. This is April 30th, just last week on Wednesday at approximately 4 p.m. I was down on the site taking some updated pictures for the staff report and for the PowerPoint presentation. So um, prior to drafting the staff report, um, I made a point of traveling past the property on several different times of the day to get an idea. It's the windshield survey of parking, which is quite, actually quite valuable for planners. Um, and this site has a couple of different interesting things. One is its parking uh, pattern tends to be more on the evenings because it's surrounded by quite a bit of residential. Um, two, it's marked for two hours, so it's limited. People can't come to work um, and park on the street and uh, leave their car all day like they can in some parts of the town where we're getting complaints now from, from employee parking in the residential neighborhoods of White Oaks. And the third is that there is quite a, quite a bit of available street parking um, along Walnut Street during um, post-morning and all the way up to early afternoon, and the, excuse me, all the way up to early evening. So there's two sets of findings that I have for you to make tonight. The first are the required findings for the conditional use permit, and the second set are for design review. 
Uh, the findings all have a staff's basis that are attached to them that are included in your staff report, and I will go over some of them if you have specific questions for them. So staff is recommending approval for the adaptive reuse of the structure for a new dental practice, which would include the addition of a new structure to the rear of the property and also the conditional use permit, granting of a conditional use permit for the reduction of two parking spaces to accommodate the addition in the back and also meet the Secretary of Interior standards. If you look through the staff report, you'll see that there was one of the, one of the, um, the guidelines from the Secretary of Interior standards is not to place a premium on parking over a historic structure, so not to have the parking be proud of the structure or to be more important than the structure itself, but instead to have parking be a, as, a, as a secondary measure and out, out of the site from the street elevations that are prominent. There's a lot of information when you do these types of projects. So I, at some point, I'm going to show you the recommendation and also the formal motion and um, open myself up to questions. Great. Um, does anybody have any questions for Gavin at this point? Just a real quick one about um, the street parking there. So my guess is there's at least one, possibly two spots on the street on Walnut, and there's probably two or three on Holly Street that are on street parking. Yes, that's correct. So when you say that there, in theory, there needs to be nine parking spaces, mm -hmm. are you saying nine parking spaces on site? Or yes, you, nine on site. Nine on yeah. site. We only have, we have one zoning district that allows us to count street parking, the IA. Uh, it's an anomaly out of the two dozen zoning districts we have, the Industrial Arts District allows us to count on street parking. So in this case, if they needed two spaces and there were two in front of the business on the public street, we could count that as, as meeting the minimum. In every other zoning district, we require all of the on street parking um, that we count to be on off the street and on the site. But this having a corner lot has yes, a it lot has more, more park, yes, parking it does. than it has a, more street a standard frontage. lot. It does. Any other questions for Gavin at this point? No? Okay. Thank you, Gavin. Thank you. Would the applicant like to come forward and speak? Or the applicant's representative? Well, really quickly, um, does anybody have any questions for the applicant? Should I invite him forward? No, I don't. No? Okay. You can go ahead and take your seat. Thank you. And um, then I do have four speaker cards from the public on this item, so we'll go ahead and open up for public comment. And first I have Nancy Oliver. I'm Nancy Oliver. I live at 147 Belvedere Avenue in San Carlos, and I'm with the San Carlos Heritage Association. So we've had uh, dealings with this property before. When the previous tenants moved in, you know, they wanted to knock out a wall upstairs between two bedrooms to make a room for their drafting room. That was not a problem because that is a replaceable wall eventually if someone wants to do it. And we had some other things that the city was trying to require them to do. I won't go into all of them, but we were able to meet with the city on behalf of those people and get some of those requirements reduced because we felt that the things they were requiring would have ruined part of the interior. So it was very satisfactory all the way around. So now I would just like to say that I think that the Secretary of the Interior Standards for this edition have been well kept. I would say that when looking at the smooth uh, stucco, I would almost say that you could have also done a shingled exterior as long as the shingle pattern was different and it might blend in a lot better. Um, the other thing that I'm concerned about I haven't heard a word on and I would really like to know if the applicants are going to try to change the coffered ceiling in the living room and the beautiful stairway that goes up from that living room, and then the dining room is absolutely lovely. And I would hope that they would be able to retain those features in this beautiful house. Otherwise, I would say it's a very nice addition. 
But those three things I did have questions about. Oh, and the one other thing, I hate to see mature trees removed unless it's absolutely necessary because they do form a setting in that place and will not be replicated. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nancy. Could Jeremy ask for a question? Yes, um, I'm sorry, Nancy. Mm -hmm. May, uh, we have a question from the commission for you. I apologize. I, I was just curious whether you had looked at the landscaping plan um, and you'd made a comment about the, the maturity of the trees and maintaining mature trees. Did you have any uh, other thoughts on the landscaping plan? The oh, mountain? no, I think actually the other things are probably fine. Um, I'm not sure if a fountain out in front of a bungalow is really appropriate because I don't think they usually have that. But, you know, that would be up to you to decide or on design review. But the other uh, landscaping seems to be like it would be nice, but I did worry about those beautiful trees because it does form a beautiful setting right now. Anybody else? Any other questions for Nancy? Okay, thank, thank you. you. Next I have Kara Vonk. Thank you, members of the Planning Commission. My name is Cara Vonk, 423 Hillcrest Road, San Carlos. And um, I'm also a member of the San Carlos Heritage Association. And I did work on the 1991 Historic Resources Survey under the direction of Mr. Kent Seavey, architectural historian. And as Nancy mentioned, we've been very uh, interested in maintaining and preserving the historic character of San Carlos. I do have some questions. Uh, first of all, let me comment. I, I hope that you will approve the seven parking spaces instead of the nine. I'd hate to see parking in front of the building uh, you know, to accommodate the two extra spaces. Uh, I do have some questions, however. Um, the first one I'd like to address is the ADA access. Because right now, um, and when we worked with the prior uh, tenants, or owners, the ADA access was done on the side of the building, and that was so there would be minimal impact on the visuals of the front of this historic building. Um, and under, it's my understanding, under the Historic Building Code, it is, it is um, authorized to have, you know, alternative access to that of the front door. So it was mentioned briefly that there's going to be some kind of an elevator. Um, that front patio is enclosed, brick enclosed, and then there are, there's the dining room to the right, if you're standing in front of it, with windows. And so I'm just wondering what kind of impact a, um, you know, a uh, lift is going to have on the front of this historic building. And then also, I, I'm very concerned about the interior um, and whether that is going to be preserved. They, I don't know if you've been inside, but it has beautiful woodwork. And then another question is, how is the interior going to transition to the new portion? It looks like all of the walls on the first um, level in the back there are, are going to have to be removed. So you know, how does that transition from the old to the new? Um, let's see. Also, uh, I was also somewhat concerned about the smooth stucco. I know under the Secretary of the Interior Standards, you have to show that when you add on, you it has to be different so you don't get that Disneyland fake look. Um, but it can be done in a more subtle way with maybe different size shingles, wood siding, but something that's a little more rustic that would fit in. I, I, just imagining this stucco appendage on the back of this beautiful wood building, it, it just seems odd to me. Also, I wasn't sure what kind of roofing material was going to be used. It kind of looks like the metal raised seams, standing raised seam, but I, it's hard to tell from the drawings. Um, and then the last item, the trees. Um, I'm hoping we can keep at least the one magnolia, the one closest to the street, because it is a very substantial building. It, it makes a very imposing impression. And it would be nice to have a mature tree there instead of the couple of lollipop trees that are 
uh, proposed. Um, and also that's Holly Street, a very busy street, and it would provide a bit of a buffer, I would think, and also for pedestrians. So thank you for listening to all my comments. Um, I, I really do compliment staff because they really understood the Secretary of the Interior standards. And so I, I think we made a lot of progress in the city of San Carlos. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, I have Melissa Montgomery. Montalongo, I'm sorry. Oh, yep, Montalongo. Hi. Hi there. Um, I'm Melissa Montalongo. I'm the actual neighbor next door at 517 Walnut. And um, this is new to me, but I had witnessed a um, conversation that woke me up. Um, some gentlemen were speaking underneath my bedroom window. And as I woke, I was hearing a conversation that disturbed me. Um, there was a lot of talk about things don't have to be fully ADA. Have you seen the rest of San Carlos? Um, there was a lot of talk about removing things um, on the home, even though it's a historic home. Um, there was a very elitist, we don't have to play by the rules attitude. We have people working on this that are in city council. We'll get it passed. We want neighbors. We haven't had neighbors in a year. We miss the old neighbors. They were very kind. Um, but I wanted that noted because it really disturbed me. It's not becoming of the reputation of San Carlos to hear that type of rogue um, thought that we will just put, pass it through and honestly um, I didn't know anything today until our landlord had come over and, and talked to me and now the things that she was telling me or um, in the plans were I already knew and heard the conversations um, I hope they retain the beauty of the home I did spend time in the home and it is fantastic the home next to us is clearly one of the reasons why we chose to move on that street um, the trees were important to the beauty of San Carlos. Um, there's already enough apartments and duplexes on that street. And you're slowly losing the beauty of what drove us to this city. Um, I would hate for it to look like Cupertino. San Carlos needs to look like San Carlos. Um, and as for parking, I, I know it was great that he showed that picture and there was nobody there, but I live there. and. Parking's a circus, it's a mess. Um, we have the people from the corner, um, I'm not sure what the real estate business is, and they do the thing of moving their cars every two hours. Um, on this side of Holly, all the VCA employees park there. So you have supposed to have nine spots, you have seven. I'm assuming that they have a full staff, because I know my dentist has multiple people running around, and I'm assuming that they all drive, and I'm assuming that the dentists drive. So where do all these people go? That's just something that kind of doesn't make sense to me. And that's all I have. Thank you for listening. Thank you. And then uh, the last speaker card I have on this agenda item is Esther Adu. I hope I said that. Hello. Hi there. Um, I live at 722 Elm. My name is Esther Adut. Um, I want to discuss, uh, first of all, the parking. I think it is completely inadequate, given that there will be two dentists with most likely at least two office staff and a hygienist and an um, uh, office worker. So we're talking about uh, six people already, and there's only seven parking spots. So their one and only patient better be handicapped or else that person has to park in the street. And uh, like the person who lives in the property next door said, parking in that street is very tough, despite the photo that was taken. That street has a lot of multifamily housing on it. Four-story apartment buildings, um, triplexes, townhouses, all kinds of things are there. And parking is so bad that that's the reason it's a two-hour parking zone, because parking is competitive there and difficult to get. So this project starts out with two fewer parking spots than the very minimum that the law requires. And it's not one dentist, it's two. So um, basically, a lot of more cars are going to be jammed to a place where it's already very difficult parking. And there really isn't a lot of reason why they can't add two more spots. 
Uh, the only reason is that they want to build a slightly bigger addition to the property, but they could maintain their desired use uh, with slightly smaller uh, back building and have the minimum uh, parking. That's the reason it is a minimum is because it is necessary. The other concern I have, which is a very significant one, is the cars needing to back out of that parking lot right into Walnut Street, which is a very central uh, commercial street in San Carlos. Um, and the reason that um, this chart is misleading, if you look at your um, attachment six in your packet where it shows the parking, or yeah, it's called A.0, I guess, it's attachment E, the site plan, and the so-called hammerhead um, the struct, uh, design of this that was discussed, um, if you only have one car in the parking lot that would like to move uh, any of these cars, they would back out, go forward, turn left into the left side of the hammer, rear, reverse into the right, and then facing forward, drive out to Walnut Street. And that makes perfect sense unless another patient has come into the parking lot, in which case you have two cars facing each other, and the only way that can be resolved is by that car backing out into Walnut Street. And in addition, that really only works if every single one of these cars actually goes all the way in and does the hammer thing instead of backing right out, which the, you know, the, the spot that's closest to Walnut is very likely to do. But in any case, this design is going to require cars backing out because it's a two-way driveway on one driveway width. The only way I see that this would be resolved is by doing uh, L-shaped driveway, which ex the hammerhead would be extended into Holly, and the cars, this would truly be a one-way drive where cars can exit out of Holly. That way, um, it gives more space. It reduces the risk to cars on this busy road and all the residents that drive around it. Um, I just don't see um, how this is safe at all, uh, nor that it makes sense to allow a, a too big construction at the back um, at the cost of safety here and a proper driveway and the minimum amount of parking. As to whether this meets the uh, historic preservation guidelines, I actually don't think that it does because it removes a fireplace at the back. That's the living room and, you know, back side of the house fireplace, which is a very significant interior feature, which will be completely gone, and all the views of the lovely living room and living spaces of the first floor are going to be gone because there's going to be a tumor of a structure attached right to the back of it. So, um, and the view along Holly Street will be completely different, whereas now the in, in, integrity of the structure is that it has a yard. The, the, there, there will be no yard to speak of. Um, and the fireplace, I mean, is not replaceable. Um, and the, um, uh, uh, the chimney all will be gone. Um, so. Um, let me see. Um, I feel that the elevator uh, for handicapped people should not be in the front at all because it definitely disturbs the aesthetics, the features, and the spatial relations of the building right in the front at Walnut. Uh, and uh, like my uh, neighbors have commented, the interior really matters in this house. The interior is lovely. And if you have the handicapped people in which wheelchairs entering out the, through the front and having to get their dental work done in the addition in the back, there's going to have to be passageway arranged for them through the interior, which will obviously cause modifications. Whereas if the patients who are handicapped or even other patients entered through the back right into where they will be receiving their dental care, or close to it, it would uh, very likely diminish the need to make significant modifications inside, and it will keep the aesthetics of the front porch and the entire front facade of the building. Uh, the spatial relations and the features are significant. Um, Um, 
there are no special conditions in this project that justify reducing um, parking. There's nothing special about this dental practice versus any other dental practice. Uh, the preservation of the building does not require that they have fewer parking structures. They could preserve, they could do the historic preservation just as well with having two more parking spots. Um, and um, the use will be, this particular use as it's planned now with this driveway and parking will be detrimental to people in the vicinity because the neighbors will be affected by people backing out. There are children in that neighborhood. Um, and it will drastically reduce the amount of parking during daytime that's available to the local residents. Um, there is a parking issue there. There's a lot of people in apartments. And it's right next to the commercial area of San Carlos. So if you ever are there like on Thursdays during farmer's market, there's absolutely no parking there. Um, and that starts at 2 p.m. Any kind of festival, there's no parking there. Weekends, it's very hard to park there. Um, the report also says that this is not really that different from the prior use of an architect's office, but it's drastically different. If you remember, even in the picture shown by, by the planning committee, um, it showed three cars in the architect's office. There were hardly any cars there at any given time because the architect's office is not the kind of place where people come in all day long and sit in several chairs. Most dentists have three to four chairs that they use all day long. Um, the um, idea that the view doesn't change much from Holly Street is not correct because the entire um, beauty of the building will be gone. No one will be able to see the rear side of the building anymore due to the attachment of the structure to it. Um, and um, um, the, the elimination of a door uh, in swapping it for a window also affects the integrity of the house because that door was very close to the kitchen and when you walk into a historic home and you kind of want to know, well, this is how life used to be in the old time, this is how people lived, there will be nothing there to indicate what was the use of that particular room anymore. But I think the, the key um, things I'd like the committee to consider is the backing out of the driveway, that the driveway should go around to Holly so cars can exit properly and safe, safely, and that there's really no good reason to have less than the very minimum parking that the law requires for a dental office. There are two dentists here and a lot of square feet. Thank you. And we also do have your, uh, your written email for the public record. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I have two more speaker cards, uh, one from the applicant. And I wanted to ask, uh, Matt, would you like to wait for our other speaker to finish so that you can respond to all, to all inquiries? OK, great. Uh, in that case, I have Candy Fabreo Montalongo. Please come forward. Thank you, Planning Commission. My name is Candy Fabreo Montalongo, and I live next door at 517 Walnut. Um, I think most of the previous uh, public have already voiced what I was going to bring up, um, but let me just reiterate that. The, uh, the parking situation on the corner of Walnut and Holly is a difficult one. Um, when, they, uh, when the city sent out a, uh, a survey for people that wanted uh, permits, I was definitely one of the residents that opted to, to have that option of having a permit there because it is difficult to find parking and trying to avoid a ticket on that street is, is, is a challenge sometimes. And if you have to you know, be out of town, you have to resort to parking on Holly, which doesn't have the uh, two-hour uh, requirement. Um, also, I, I would like to also add on to the ADA compliance of the building. And I want to make sure that, that, that the right solution is found for that, because the, the I agree that the lift um, is, is not a, a very aesthetic solution. Um, there's already an existing ramp there. And it, it doesn't seem to me it's clear the intent of removing a ramp 
replacing it with mulch um, just to put a lift in. Um, so yeah, I'd like to hear a comment on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now, uh, Matt Grocott, could you come forward? Thank you. So I'm speaking as the designer on the project for the applicant, and I just wanted to address a few things uh, so that you have answers for some of the questions that were raised. Um, the first thing, actually, I want to say something that uh, doesn't relate to all the questions and everything, but just the joy it was to work on this project because as some of the people have spoke about uh, the historic nature of the building and the style of the building. It, when you're inside, it is a real gem and it's a real joy to work on something that has such integrity uh, historically. It was uh, a, a lot of fun. Um, the interior use, uh, when the applicant first went out and hired an architect, uh, they hired an out of, um, out of the area firm that specializes in dental offices. And uh, of course, them working from a distance uh, didn't know quite all the intricacies of the building. And so originally, there were going to be some things done that would require the, uh, when you go in, there's a stair that goes up and there's kind of a balcony. It's not really a balcony, it's a, it's, it's a lower hallway, if you will. Um, and that was going to be removed in order to create access from the front door to the medical offices or the, the exam rooms. And when I went in and took a look at it and realized uh, particularly the change in elevation, you step down a little bit to go out the back doors, I knew that wasn't going to work in a, except to take out this, uh, the, this upper hallway. And so we looked at other options and uh, where to put the the uh, reception area and uh, where they were going to have their offices as the, the doctors and so forth and where were they going to have the break rooms. And what we came up with, I know you don't have a floor plan, uh, I don't believe, maybe you do, but, uh, oh, you do have a floor plan. Okay, so the idea is that you walk in and in the, in the entry, uh, or the, what's the living room when it was a residence, that's the reception area. And then you're taken uh, through, uh, a doorway to what is currently, I don't know what else to call it except a middle interior room. And then there's a stair that currently goes up from a side, the side entrance that a couple people were talking about. That stair will be removed. It was put in actually when that home was added onto. And one point of fact that is, is of interest is when the home was moved to the current site that it's on, it was smaller. It's been added onto. The, the, um, the portion on the very rear of the building was an addition that was put on to the home when it was moved to that site. Um, and the, the secondary stair was put in at that time. So the secondary stair will come out, and what that does is allow passage to the addition that's on the back. What that does is leave everything else in the home or in the, the building uh, left intact. The coffered ceiling, all the things that everybody talked about are all left intact. The only item that comes out that was mentioned also is this secondary fireplace uh, that, that's on the back. And again, that was part of an addition that came later in the, in the structure's history. Um, the handicap ramp, by people uh, pointing that out, they've pointed out something that we wrestled with as, does, as uh, you know, looking at the architecture of the building, there actually is on the Holly Street side of the enclosed porch, there is a place where later brickwork was done to close up an opening that did exist at one time. And we looked at that as an option when we had the parking going all the way around the building and we were gonna try and put some handicapped spaces on the Holly side. But when we look, when we met with the uh, historic architect from Stanford and they, she wanted us to treat the building differently and push back from that side yard. That meant in order to get the same amount of square footage, pushing back into the yard and eliminating the place we had the handicapped parking. And so we figured the best place to put this lift 
was next to the front porch where most of the, you know, it should be pretty well hidden by the landscaping and parking of vehicles and so forth. Um, but we were trying to be sensitive to the building and disturb it the least amount of possible. The existing ramp, it should be noted, is does not meet handicap standards. Oh. Uh, it's too steep and it's too rough of a material. And we also felt like uh, the way that that was done was um, not respective to the historic architecture that's there now, uh, the, the way the ramp was installed. Um, one thing that wasn't noticed, uh, no, noted by uh, staff gave a very uh, thorough report on our process and, and how we ended up where we are. But one thing that was, um, was not mentioned is that we do have two motorcycle spaces and we have spaces for uh, bicycle parking and that was intended staff was recommending to us when we were taking out two spaces to put in something to mitigate the loss of those two spaces um, and then the last thing i wanted to mention is i i live on that street just down the, down from this structure and while there is parking issues on the weekend when people are home uh, there virtually is no problem during the week. I come home for lunch and there's parking always in front of my house and when I come home in the evenings you know at 5 or 4 30 or whatever there's always parking in front but it's it's in the evening that there tends to be a problem uh, because of the residences as staff noted. So thank you. Oh, does anybody have any questions for Matt at this point? Matt um, one of the things that I noticed that wasn't part of this is um, signage. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I don't know what you're thinking of as far as signs for the, the dental office or if that's something that's coming later um, as part of this. But I, I was just kind of curious what type of signage. Well, that is. Something that we did talk to staff about, and we talked to the historic architect. One of the ideas, first I should say, the idea is to keep signage to a minimal level so it doesn't just detract from the, the structure. Um, one of the thoughts is possibly to put some signage on the what's essentially the dining room, the front room on the window, um, perhaps in an in a old style like you would see in a, oh, a something that looks old old fashioned and you know historic uh, the other idea is to do something like what the architects had done where they hung something from the from the porch that's what they had but we will go we we've agreed with staff to submit that uh, separately and to have it reviewed at the staff level and the second question I had was sort of concerning landscaping mm -hmm. and um, are the four trees that are removed, are those heritage trees? Or no, there are no heritage trees so on the site. None of them are heritage. None of them are um, heritage. Are the two trees that are on the sort of southeast side next to 517, are those the crepe myrtles that were talked about in yes. here? Okay, so they're yes. kind of the taller trees to, to break up the view from the two buildings. Correct. Okay, yeah. thank you. You're welcome. Matt, I'm sorry. I have a question. I'm not sure if it's for you or for um, or or for the people you represent. But I'm curious: is there is there an import, an employee parking plan? Just if there are two dentists, two hygienists, um, office workers, are they going to be encouraged to park and ride? Is there some sort of employee parking plan that you're aware of? I'll have to let them answer that. Okay, thank you. One last thing. Uh, did you have a position on that magnolia tree that was mentioned earlier as to whether or not it would be a problem to keep it in versus uh, an advantage to taking it out? The problem with the magnolias, both of them, is uh, they do, the, the way the root structure is, they are destroying the sidewalks and they're problematic trees. I actually believe that taking out some of these trees will allow the home to, or I keep calling it a home because it was originally a home, will allow the historic building to be more expressive on that site than it is now. It's much too shrouded. I noticed when I was trying to take pictures and do my work, it was really difficult, especially on the Holly Street side, to get a decent picture. And, it's, and a lot of it has to do with the trees that are shrouding it. One last thing, and that was um, the, several people brought up the siding on the addition mm -hmm. and 
just curious your take on going from the shingles to what is potentially I don't know the what danger the I are. think with that is similar to you know when the addition was done when it was moved to that site of course it wasn't yet a historic building because it hadn't been in existence that long but the fact that an addition was done and it was done in all the same detailing it's really hard to tell that an addition was done you have to go inside the only way you really can tell for sure that an addition was done is there's a room upstairs on the back bedroom that has a, a little hatch door and you open it and suddenly you you realize you're looking down on what used to be a porch roof uh, that was left in place when they added on the the thing that you try to do as a designer when you're working with an historic building like that, it, in my opinion, is you try to pick up the same rhythm on, on windows and fenestration. Um, you try to use the same geometry. That's why we did the low slope roofs, um, which, by the way, it is a standing seam metal roof. And, and, and use some of the other elements, like we did with the water table and so forth. But you try to do things different enough that it's obvious that this is the addition and this is the existing structure that's historic. You want the historic structure to stand out on its own. So. Thank you, Matt. You're welcome. And then uh, may I ask the other uh, applicant representative to come forward just to answer my question about parking? Thank you. Hi, I'm Bob Pelzer. I'm one of the dentists uh, for the practice, and um, indeed, just a few things. And one, I've like I say, I did indeed have a craftsman-style home when I was in Michigan. So I've gone through one, lived in one, and I enjoy one tremendously. And this was an opportunity that when we saw it, boy, we thought this would just be spectacular—a great spot for us to have something that's, that's truly stunning and different. And we've looked at this as a great project, and we worked very hard with Matt and some other people to try and make sure that we preserve the inside. Uh, one of the initial designs, like Matt was saying, wanted to take out some of that, and I was vehemently against that and worked with Matt to find a way to keep that structure intact, and we look forward to that being an integral part of it, and that's part of the reason we wanted to have everything go to the back so we keep the front as untouched as we possibly could, and we look forward to keeping that. For parking, uh, we currently are in downtown uh, Laurel Street now, and, and we don't have staff parking in the current building we're in, even though we are tenants there and uh, we don't we're not the owners. And uh, our staff, for the years we've been there, and frankly, the partners in the group before us have had the same understanding that typically staff does not park in the lot. Uh, and over the years I've been here and the previous owners of the practice as well, they didn't have any problem with the staff finding parking on the street where it was acceptable. Uh, certain people carpool and certain people are close enough for uh, they, one of our staff can even walk to work where we currently are. So uh, we don't have a current plan for that, but my sense is we would be finding uh, adequate parking that's legally fine to w in town and, uh, or work with carpooling or some other way of mitigating that. But we, uh, we currently do not park in our parking occasionally. If somebody's got a, you know, an issue where they got to run out or something, we'll see other members of uh, offices in our current building do the same thing uh, and occasionally I've done it if I've got a meeting I've got to get to or something but currently the the understanding is staff doesn't park in a lot doesn't uh, the parking is for the patients and uh, it's worked out fine in the 20 close to 20 years I've been where I am so great thank you does anybody have any other questions for the applicant while he's up here no okay thank you very much thank you all right Well, at this point, um, if we can get a motion to close the public hearing on this item, that would be great. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. OK. Any comments from Planning Commission members on this item before we take a vote? I had just one, I guess, a comment not I'm not sure if it's a comment or even more of a um, more of a question but um, did in the parking study that we did downtown Lisa did we include the Holly Walnut area in that parking study we included um, the first portion of the block so I think it went right up to the CVS building and okay. then stopped there it didn't go any further on this portion of the block but it, it was close but it did not include this block entirely okay great thank you um, 
And then one other question, even though it does sound like the applicant's going to do their very best to keep the interior relatively the same, and then that was important to them in the design of this, I'm just curious what the Secretary of Interior's guidelines or San Carlos's guidelines are. Do we even have the right to tell somebody on a historic structure that they can't touch the inside? Um, the Secretary of the Interior Standards are designed to preserve the character-defining features of historic properties, and that consists primarily of the external, the right. exterior portion. And uh, the Secretary of Interior Standards, um, um, you know, they promote adaptive reuse of st structures. I mean, oftentimes, um, you know, depending upon what new use may go inside, it's not always... Um, possible to preserve every feature inside within the interior of the home. So basically over the years where they've landed on in terms of the standards and guidelines, it's really about how you're preserving and treating and making changes to the um, exterior of the building. Right. Okay. That was anything? my understanding as well. Thank you, Lisa. Does anybody else have any oh. um, you know we've already closed public comment on this item. Um, thank you for the information. Does anybody have any other comments or, or any other deliberating items they want to talk about? Okay, well then I can entertain a motion on this item. I move that the Planning Commission approve the request for conditional use permit approval for a parking reduction and grant design review approval for the addition, including tree removals and landscaping for a historic structure at 501 Walnut Street based on the required findings and for the reasons outlined in the staff report. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Thank you very much, everybody. Okay, now on to our next public hearing item, item B, 110 Glen Way, number 7, APN 046053, excuse me, 350, consideration of a conditional use permit. And, and through the chair, before we get started, I would just like to welcome and introduce um, contract planner Andrea Mardisik. Um, Andrea works for Near Martin and Associates, and as um, the commission may recall, since Stephanie Bertolo Davis resigned with NMA, we've had Andrea um, help us out tremendously with a number of projects um, that we've had to process in the planning division. And this is her uh, first presentation that we will be giving, uh, that she will be given, giving to the commission. So I just wanted to take a moment and welcome Andrea. Great, Thank welcome you. Andrea. Thank you very no much. pressure, no pressure. Yeah. <laughs> no pressure. Don't mess this up. <laughs> so this would You're on be record like an right now. Audition, I guess, yeah. is what it would be. It's like American Idol. Oh gosh. <laughs> yeah. and she, You're doesn't, on. she doesn't know that Scott Marsters is sitting in the wrong location. Yeah. Although I kinda like it. Yeah. I mean, I miss you a little bit, Scott, but hey, um, I had nice nothing to be able to, to spread out. I had nothing to do with it. But your name tag was there? Is it was there. It, yeah. And you just sit wherever your name tag is. I, you know. So if I move you down your name tag down there. You know. All right, okay. <laughs> Andrea. Thank you very much. Good evening. Um, as Lisa mentioned, my name is Andrea Martisic. Uh, I'm presenting the staff report for a conditional use permit for an office associated with automobile an automobile sales intermediary business, as well as online automotive sales at 110 Glenway Suite Number no. Seven. Oops. Let's go back. So the suite is uh, 855 square feet. It's located within an approximately 13,000 square foot building at the GW Williams Business Park. The parcel is uh, zoned light industrial and the general plan designation is planned industri industrial. There's several suites within the property. Uh, some of the surrounding uh, businesses are a janitorial business, garden service, service business, and a printing shop. So the applicant is proposing uh, two businesses which will operate out of the location. The first is car free, which acts as an intermediary between auto sellers and buyers. The business is internet based and facilitates used car sales between individuals. Everything is done either by telephone or internet. Car free also created a technology which allows potential buyers to test drive uh, the cars they're interested in alone. 
The use associated with this business requires a conditional use permit for office, uh, specifically because auto brokers are excluded from the automobile sales definition of the San Carlos Municipal Code. The second business, Carlipso, is a subsidiary of the first one. Uh, this business can work either in conjunction with Car Free or independently. Uh, the business will be able to sell cars directly to auction sites, for example, um, acting as a dealer rather than being an intermediary, um, as well as participate in other services that only dealers are, are allowed to participate in. Although the use is classified as auto sales under the municipal code, um, it is important to note that the actual activities in the location are more like an office. Again, uh, no clients will be coming on site. They will not be storing cars on site uh, nor displaying them on site. Uh, the businesses will operate from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Mondays through Fridays, and they have a total of five employees that work at the office, uh, all of whom either carpool together or take Caltrain. As you can see on the floor plan, there's a large office area and smaller areas uh, assigned for storage in a conference room. Um, as mentioned previously, the applicant is not proposing any on-site sales. Staff has added condition number two to the draft conditional use permit, which would require re-review by the Planning Commission if the business plan changes and they do want to move forward <coughs> with on-site sales. So this is a proposed uh, parking plan. You'll see in the middle is Suite 7, um, the floor plan. They have a parking spot directly in front of their garage door that enters their, um, their suite. That uh, is accessed from Glenway. There's a driveway into that. Uh, onto the side is a parking, uh, a parking lot that services the GW Williams Park. They also have a one spot in there, which is labeled KB. Uh, in addition to uh, these spots, there's 31 uh, visitor spots which are not assigned to a specific business they're available for any business within the park uh, per the parking requirements they would need to provide one parking space for every 300 square feet of office use uh, which would require in three parking uh, parking spaces as you can see they have two the previous business uh, also had the same parking requirements so under the municipal code they're able to continue an existing non-conforming parking situation <coughs> So these are the applicable findings that the commission must make in order to grant approval of the project. Uh, as there's no specific plans in the second uh, finding, uh, staff relies solely on the general plan uh, when evaluating the project. A full discussion of the findings is located within your staff report, um, but I can go over those if you have specific questions. And here's the final three findings. Staff is recommending approval of a conditional use permit to allow an office uh, and online automobile sales at 110 Glenway. And I am available if you have any questions. The applicants are also here as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions for Andrea at this point? No? Thank you. She did a very nice job. Did a very good job on your first presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Would the applicants like to come forward and speak? Hi, my name is Nicholas Henrichsen. Thanks for having us. And this is my co-founder and business partner, Christopher. Good to meet you guys. Um, if you want to, I can walk you through exactly how we work, so you better understand what's innovative about it and what distinguishes us from an ordinary used car dealer. Um, I'd actually be very interested for just a couple minutes, though. Okay. Yeah, thank so you. If, if you want to sell your car, you have two options to choose from right now. Either you give it to a dealer, where you lose a lot of value, or you sell it yourself and put it on Craigslist. Mm -hmm. Now what we do is we help you sell your car while you keep it. So you keep it, you go to work, you park it either in front of your house or in, or in a parking lot right here. And we have technology on the car that lets us grant access to your car to test drivers. So if somebody wants to see your car, he swipes his ID, test drives the car while we monitor the test drive on GPS. And if he makes an offer that's at or above something that you will and I will pre-agree on, we'll send him straight to the bank and he can keep the car. And if he keeps driving my car to Las Vegas? That's very far. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, test drives are limited to 20 to 25 minutes. Um, we have the identification of the person. We manage expectations up front. And so far, we haven't had any issues like that. Great. That's great. That's the description of what we do. We never store cars. We never see cars. We never touch cars. We're selling cars primarily outside of the Bay Area 
including at the East Coast, for example. So how do you, how do you get the technology onto the car? We use a network of inspection mechanics who, who basically attaches the devices. Okay, so it's not done no. at no. the person's we, home, it's not done do at a, the... No. We okay. try not to see anybody, and we, we try not to meet anybody, and not to see a car. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we spend a lot of time on the phone. Yeah. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions for the applicant? No. no. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Um, I can take a motion to close this public hearing. I move that we close the public hearing. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Thank you. Can I make a motion? Please do. I move that the Planning Commission adopt the attached resolution and determine that the dis disposition of real. Oh, you know, that's the wrong one. Is it? In the same? It is, yes. Okay. Yes, that's, that was the consent item. Oh, my bad. Um, I move that the Planning Commission approve the request for a conditional use permit to allow for an office and online auto automobile sales business at 110 Glenway, number 7, APN 046 053350, based on the findings and for the reasons incorporated in the staff report and as conditioned in the conditional use permit. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. okay. So Moving on I, I, to report, reports, correspondence, and general information. Report on recent city council actions. Yeah. Um, I don't have any update for the commission this evening. Thank you. Uh, planning commission comments or reports? Nope. No. Nope. Okay. Correspondence? I see none on the dais. And then finally, planning staff comments, reports, updates on current projects. Lisa, um, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, our next meeting is scheduled for May 19th, okay. and staff will be, be, will be bringing back the um, recommended and proposed um, changes to the zoning ordinance um, as outlined in the minutes that you adopted earlier this evening. Um, we also have um, a couple of few other updates that I can share with the Commission. Um, you may recall the project that was presented um, to you at the end of last year at 260 Shelford. This was a modification for a Sprint wireless facility. Since that time, um, the applicant Sprint has met with the neighbors. I know that they um, completed an updated noise study. All of um, this new information um, has recent, recently been submitted to the planning division, so we are taking a look at that. So that could come forward um, to the commission um, relatively, um, you know, in the near future. Um, and we have a couple of other items um, in the queue. One is um, an annexation on Cranfield. This is 17 Cranfield. Um, that one will likely come forward with to you within the next um, couple months. There is an environmental document being prepared associated with that project. We'll hear more about that later. Um, let's see, other updates. The um, City Council, um, I know we've had a lot of um, inquiries on, an up, on updates regarding the San Carlos Transit Village project. On uh, May 12th, Monday, the City Council will be um, discussing and um, re-reviewing the shuttle um, relocation analysis that was done as part of the Transit Village proposal. Um, they will be discussing that as um, just probably a study session, actually a study session. So that's information for you. That's the only um, new bit of information that um, has, you know, coming to the surface regarding any kind of update to the Transit Village project. What um, I can say is that we have heard from Sam Trans that relocating the shuttle could be um, challenging with respect to moving forward to project implementation. There should be a staff report available for um, you to review. Um, I know everyone's interested um, on the city's website under um, e-packets, so you can take a look at that. Um, and I think that's it. Great. Thank you, Lisa. Um, okay. Well, seeing nothing else, I'd like to adjourn this meeting at 820. Thank you very much, everybody.